In the six years he spent with the Toronto Argonauts, it would be hard to find one word to describe Leo Cahill. Jay Title may have put it best when he wrote that Leo could be frustrating, maddening, yet somehow successful and irresistible. One thing is for certain, Leo Cahill was never boring, and he took the Argos, the laughingstock of the Canadian Football League, and turned them into a contender. A play. For anyone who grew up in Uncle Fair and watched, that was probably the most poignant moment of a football fan's life. Leo couldn't have lasted a year in this day and age, because Leo was never politically correct, but he would say whatever was on his mind. And if you didn't like it, well, that's too bad. It's a game. It's adults playing children's games. And Leo understood this. And others didn't, and I think should have. He put some very entertaining teams on the field. I mean, they played really interesting football. And I think that's what Leo should be remembered for. Leo Cahill was born and grew up in Utica, Illinois, the youngest of four boys. He was just a, a nut about football. He would take little kids in the neighborhood and in, uh, in our yard and uh, show them things about football. So I guess you'd say that in the back of his mind, he always wanted to be a coach. Cahill played football at the University of Illinois, going to the Rose Bowl game in 1946. Although relegated to the fourth string, Leo got to play in the final minutes and made the most of it. They quoted him in the paper as saying, we may be the fifth string, but uh, you're not going to score on us either. And of course, we were all thrilled uh, listening to the radio, and he just was a, a plugger. He was, and uh, he wanted to uh, be uh, as good as he could be and didn't see any reason why he shouldn't be. After graduating, Cahill spent eight months on the front line in Korea and coached a special troops team in Japan. He returned to the United States and got a call that would change his life. I was coaching at the University of South Carolina, and uh, Perry Moss, who had been the quarterback on our Rose Bowl team at the University of Illinois, he called me and he said, Leo, he said, I got an opportunity to, uh, to go to the Montreal Alouettes in, in Canada. I'd like you to come with me. Moss was fired in 1963 and replaced by Jim Trimble. He and Cahill did not see eye to eye, and Cahill quit the following year. Just before heading back to the United States, he received a call from the Toronto Rifles of the Continental Football League who were looking for a head coach. First of all, it seemed to me that he was broke and going back to the United States and uh, made a side trip down to Toronto to see if he could get this job, which he didn't think he was going to get. We interviewed him. Uh, we hit it off, and we hired him on the spot. And he put a team together in, uh, for the first uh, two years, uh, and we won our conference both times. Uh, God knows where he got these players. I had gotten a letter from uh, the Toronto Rifles, and Leo Cahill being the head coach. And I recall, and I think it was at York University, our first camp, and what, what there was, there was a desk, and Leo was behind the desk, and everybody would line up and come up and, and give him their name and their position. And he would write the stuff down like this, right? And, and so, uh, what's your name? Tom Wilkinson. What's your position? Quarterback. Quarterback? Uh, what other position? Because <laughs> uh, most quarterbacks aren't short and fat. I always said he looked like a well-chewed piece of bubble gum. And he come in and I said, you're a, you're a quarterback? He said, yeah. I said, where are you from? He said, University of Wyoming. I said, can you play? And he said, give me a chance. And so I said, okay. And I brought him out to practice, and he, the rest is history. Meanwhile, across town, the Argos were the laughing stock of the Canadian Football League. They had not won a Grey Cup since 1952, and in the last five years had a record of 19 wins and 51 losses. Argo president Lou Heyman was well aware of the winning and entertaining football being played by the Rifles. In 1967, he hired Cahill as head coach, and the Canadian Football League would never be the same. Leo's personality was almost bigger than the league. So when I think of Leo Cahill, I think of something that's a little magic. I think of something that's missing today from the Canadian football. He's all right. TSN Profile 
is brought to you by Castrol Syntec, the active lubricant. Hired in the spring of 1967, Cahill knew he had little time to prepare the Argos for the upcoming season. He also knew attendance was the lowest in the Canadian Football League. Fans would have little patience. The Argos had last won the Grey Cup in the early 1950s. The Argos were building themselves a, a history in the mold of the, the Boston Red Sox, and the mold of the Chicago Cubs, and the mold of every team that ever broke a fan's heart. And that's what Leo came into. And the Argos go to the Eastern Conference Final against That the year, the Argos made the playoffs for the first time since 1961. They defeated Hamilton in the Eastern Semifinal. I don't think anything can ever bother this football team again, Bob. This is the greatest comeback I've ever seen. I've never seen a football team ever get 14 points behind like that and have the momentum of the other team up like that, break the other team's momentum and come back in such great fashion. But the following week, the Argos lost to Russ Jackson and the Ottawa Rough Riders in the Eastern Final. Still, Cahill's strength as a recruiter was emerging. He took players nobody else wanted, and the fans responded. It was a team known as a counterculture team. I remember walking downtown Toronto and running to Mel Prophet, and, you know, everybody looked kind of like they were at a, straight out of Easy Rider. Those were hectic social times as well, and people were wearing long hair. And we had ponytails, and we had tie-dye pants, and flowered shirts, and beads, and bracelets, and that. And he didn't make a big deal about dress. I tell you, when Toronto came into town, everyone locked up their, their daughters and their wives and everything else because the renegades are showing up. And he took those kinds of guys, and he put them all together, and he made them compete against each other of who was going to be capable of being the best on any given Sunday or any given week. They were a bunch of individualists that, that really had their own way of going, and uh, but yet at the same time, they were dedicated winners. He is going to go all the way. In 1969, Tom Wilkinson and Wally Gabler continued to share the quarterback duties. With Bill Simons in the backfield, the Argos scored more points than any team in the CFL, finishing the season behind the first place Ottawa Rough Riders. In the first game of a two-game total point series, the Argos scored their first playoff win over Ottawa in 20 years. The next game would be in the nation's capital. The Argos had an eight-point lead and momentum. Then Cahill made the statement he may be best remembered for. Somewhere along the line, I said, uh, as far as our football team is concerned, only an act of God can beat us. But that was Leo. I mean, it was, ter it was a terrific quote. He was great with the media. Um, he said outrageous things and may or may not have believed them, but he was trying to inspire the guys and get them fired up. If you got a good team, you have to say, we're good. People know you're good, and that's what Leo said. Now, the act of God, it would take an act of God. Well, the act of God actually happened, you know. <laughs> you know, but Leo was that way, you know. He thought he had a lock on it. The Ottawa media picked up that quote, ran with it, Frank Clare had it on the wall of the football, the dressing room, the players went nuts, they built this up, and of course the Argos lost the game. Actually, it was an act of God that beat us, because we go over there and they've got an iced field. We weren't terribly well prepared. They seemed to have boom ball shoes and ran around us and they hammered us, I think. I just sort of thought to myself, well, so much for the act of God. God came out and zapped the Argonauts and we ain't going to the cup. <laughs> Someone said Russ Jackson was seen walking across the Rideau Canal. The following year, the Argos slipped to 8-5, and five, but they continued to play exciting football. The Argos were a big hit on the road and drew capacity crowds at home, but Leo knew his team was getting older. Time was running out. He needed a quarterback and a runner. What lay ahead would bring Leo Cahill his greatest success and his biggest heartache. That was his closest shot at winning a Grey Cup. That was, the, that was his shot. Uh, and those were his guys. I mean, those were guys he brought in, and they should have won him a great cup. Heading into the 1971 season, the Argos were the talk of the town. The upcoming year held promise. But then Argos owner John Bassett, without consulting Cahill, announced the signing of a general manager, John Barrow, a former star with the hated Hamilton Tiger Cats. I, as an Argo, I couldn't believe they had the 
the nerve to ever hire John ba Barrel as a general manager. I mean, it was an insult to go in, and not because he wasn't a good guy and everything, but it was an insult to go in and uh, have to negotiate with him. It was like a mockery or something. Usually the job of a general manager, Cahill continued scouting, searching for talent south of the border. He needed a quarterback and running back. The runner would be Leon X-Ray McQuay, a 19-year-old from the ghetto out of the University of Tampa, too young for the NFL draft. I timed him one time from a standing start. He ran a 4-5-40 from a standing start, and he could... He could run to the line of scrimmage and stop and go left or go right and uh, with explosiveness. Leon unloads to Leon McQuay, wants to make his screen play work. But without a doubt, Cahill's biggest signing coup was Notre Dame sensation Joe Theismann, who was about to sign a contract with Don Shula's Miami Dolphins. And then all of a sudden, I start talking to this smooth, smooth individual called Leo Cahill, and he was the coach. And uh, Leo offered me a contract. He offered me $50,000 as a signing bonus of $50,000, $50,000, $50,000 a year contract, which was a lot of money. I mean, I'm kind of a guy out of college. It's a ton of money. There's no other better way to describe it, Leo being Leo. I mean, he's the best bullshitter that ever walked the face of this earth. Pardon my French, but that's what you are, Leo. What can I tell you? And I love you for it. <laughs> Joe said that. That sounds like something Joe would say. And I would say that coming from him, it takes one to know one. <laughs> he put in his book one, said, I was a great recruiter and a great person and everything else, but I, but I didn't know jack about football. And the reason that he said that was because at the time, Greg Barton was a quarterback that came from the Detroit Lions, and, and, and Joe came in at the same time. And they made a good combination. So what I did is I used to alternate them. Leo never should have, have alternated Greg Barton and I, ever. That was the biggest mistake he ever made. If he'd have let me quarterback his football teams, he'd have had at least two great cup rings. Cahill's system must have worked because the Argos finished the season in first place. Leo was named coach of the year. Leon McQuay was the CFL's leading rusher. The Argos beat the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the Eastern Final, earning a berth in the 1971 Grey Cup in Vancouver against the Calgary Stampeders. We were the best team that the league had had in a long time. We won eight, nine, ten games in a row. They had put the turf down, and it was about four or five years old, and it was raining, and it was so slick, it was like playing on a linoleum floor with water on it. You know, we were slipping and sliding. So it nullified our running game. Roger Scales would score the only Argo touchdown on a recovered fumble. Then, with less than two minutes to play, the Stampeders leading 14-11, Dick Thornton intercepted a Jerry Keeling pass. This set up a play that would haunt Leo Cahill for the rest of his life. We got down to that 11-yard line, and, I, and, and we're on the right hash marks, and I sent in the play and, and told Leon McQuay, uh, called his number and said, run to your left. And you know, with Leon's great ability, he just planted his outside foot. And when he planted that outside foot on the plane, his feet went out from under him. He went down, and his elbow hit the ground, and the ball came out. It's like yesterday for me, too. I can see handing the ball off to Leon. I can see him taking that thing on a sweep. I can see him getting hit, and I can see the ball go on the ground. Of course, Leo, typically, why did he ever give the ball to McQuaid? He had Bill Simons, the ball was on the five yard line, first down. Bill Simons, who was a good inside runner, why he didn't give the ball to Simons, nobody ever knows, but that's typical of Cahill. As far as I'm concerned, it was the right call. As far as the right, the, the Leon had been the go-to guy all year. He didn't have a reputation of fumbling. Uh, a lot of my teammates, you know, were pretty angry at him, but the call was right. Uh, and I still think uh, the, uh, the choice of who got the ball was right. Now, I always say when people ask me about the Vancouver game and the fumble and stuff like that, I said, Leon slipped and I fell. The following year, the Argos were hit with injuries. Joe Theismann led the way with a broken ankle in the season opener. The Argos never recovered, and Argo owner John Bassett fired his coach. You know, we had gone to break up. It was wrong. You know, there's no question uh, the decision to not give Leo